There is really no word other than hero that sums up my next guest. He is a cardiologist who brought not one, but two runners back from the brink of death during a marathon recently. And he is here today to teach you how you can be heart healthy with three of the top foods you should be eating every single day to help prevent heart disease. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. My guest today is Dr. Steve Loam. He is the medical director. Director of Montage Cardiology and the and Community Hospital of the Monterey. I'm going to retake that. I'm so sorry. That's okay. They're going to uh, Medical Director Montage Cardiology Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula. All right, got it. <clears throat> That's a mouthful, man. All right. Dr. Steve Loam is my guest today. He is the medical director of Montage Cardiology and Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula, and he is one extraordinary gentleman, and it is such a privilege to have him on the show today to make us all a little bit more heart healthy. Dr. Loam, thank you so very much for making the time, my friend. No, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on my favorite podcast here. Ah, well, you have an incredible story, and I cannot wait to hear it from you. But I want to start with the three heart healthy tips that the exam roomies can put into practice for themselves today to really keep their hearts beating in tip top condition. We're talking about three foods. So, what are those three foods? Give me the one that's at the top of the list. Well, here, first, I'd say beans, of course, everybody, it's easy for a cardiologist to say beans, beans, good for your heart, you know, and, you know, leave out that next part of the saying, but, uh, you know, beans are high protein, high fiber, no cholesterol, no saturated fat, and there's still a lot of uh, antioxidants and, and minerals and iron and everything in there. And uh, they don't cause uh, inflammation in, uh, in a vast majority of people. So they're certainly one of the top heart healthy foods that I recommend. Is there any particular bean that you would gravitate toward more than another? Is the black bean the magical bean, or is there some super tucked away bean that only comes from the tippy top of a mountain in some tucked away region in the world? No, not really. Honestly, some of the magic about beans is it being a protein source and our country being so fixated on protein, 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 protein. And one of the big benefits of eating beans uh, to, you know, to get your protein is, is not always just in the bean, it's in the fact that when people eat beans, they eat less meat and less animal products for a source of protein. And while there is some magic in, in unprocessed plant-based foods that can be very beneficial for heart health, a lot of the magic for heart health actually comes in not consuming the animal-based foods, the meat, the eggs, the dairy for your protein. So really any bean is great, especially when you're eating beans for protein or lentils for protein, instead of eating animal-based sources of protein. But the one bean that perhaps has been shown to do a little bit more cholesterol-lowering effect is, is actually soy in the portfolio diet by Dr. David Jenkins. Uh, has some magical properties itself that can actually help lower cholesterol numbers a little bit better. Uh, maybe you don't want to go too insane with a lot of, uh, lot of soy every single day with too many servings, but certainly keeping some in the diet is important. See, there it is, soy coming back into the diet. It's it's a healthy thing. People should not fear soy. Uh, I guess, you know, a lot of people worry about that from cancer, but you're saying from a cardiology standpoint, you're definitely giving this thing the green light as well. Oh, yeah, no no question about it. Again, it's a, you know, a good protein source. Not that protein is that critical. As long as you're eating unprocessed, plant-based, and enough calories, you'll get all the protein you need. But, you know, again, there's this fixation in our, in our culture that you need to get protein. So it helps those people transition to think, oh, I'm getting a complete protein here and you're eating less animal foods, and it has cholesterol-lowering effects. So it's definitely a, a win. You know, growing up for me, when I was eating beans, it was always a can of baked beans. And now I look at the ingredients list on there. It's got probably some pork fat in there, molasses, sugar, a couple of kinds. Are those still heart healthy? Well, not necessarily. Again, you know, eating beans for the protein source is great, but you really, anything you eat, you got to look at the company that it keeps, right? So if they're adding sugar, if they're adding animal fat to it, it's going to have cholesterol and saturated fats, which will drive up your cholesterol numbers and uh, promote inflammation of the, of the vessels. So it's not necessarily a good thing. Now, certainly you could get beans from a can. Uh, of course, it's great to have organic and you know BPA-free if you can, but just make sure you look at the ingredient list and there's only one ingredient. 
you know, the beans, the black beans or, or whatever, not a bunch of other uh, unhealthy ingredients added to it. All right. So now we've got beans. Good for the heart. Good for the rest of the body. But that's for another show. Uh, number two on your list. What do you have for us, Doc? I have greens, beans and greens. So uh, green, uh, green leafy vegetables, of course, you know, uh, can be high fiber, high iron, lots of uh, um, antioxidants and phytonutrients in it. And uh, some of the greens, such as arugula and um, <clears throat> even, you know, pretty much all almost any green beets, uh, beet greens have high uh, nitric oxide uh, ability for you to produce that. And this is what Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn really, really emphasizes in his patients with critical heart disease that are trying super hard to reverse their heart disease and do everything they can. You're pounding those greens three times a day, sometimes five times uh, a size of your fistful, boil it down, put some balsamic vinegar on there. And, uh, and that helps to just bathe the vascular system, bathe the circulation in, in those uh, nitric oxide producing um, uh, components there, which helps to improve artery function and is one of his key components to heart disease prevention and reversal. Let me ask you about uh, iceberg lettuce. Technically, it's a green. I don't know how much you know about the, the ins and outs of iceberg here. Um, I've just heard that in terms of greens, it's kind of like, eh, it's at the lower end of the scale. Are there still some heart healthy properties in iceberg lettuce, which I assume could be the most popular form in the standard American diet? Yeah, yes, indeed. No, there is, there is some. It's, it's just when you're looking at different types of greens and you look at the nutrient density, the, the fiber, the antioxidant uh, uh, capacity that, or that's in that actual food, iceberg lettuce is, is lower down. There's no harmful ingredient. There's no cholesterol. There's no saturated fat. There's nothing that's bad for you. It's just if you're looking for more of those micronutrients, um, you're going to have a little bit less in the iceberg lettuce. And of course, the, the issue, the concern is um, not necessarily the lettuce itself. It is what people are putting on the lettuce. So if you're putting ranch dressing on there, not a good thing for sure. Uh, if you're using vinegars uh, and healthier type dressings, then that's, that's okay. You know, I was, you were reading my mind as you were saying that I'm wondering like, what is the tipping point for a salad when it ceases to be healthy? Is it when it is drenched in ranch dressing and topped with uh, croutons that are really laden in oil and there's a lot of cheese and maybe some bacon bits bacon on there bits. too? Yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's right. I mean, the salad itself is fine, but I always tell my patients that I have a lot of patients that say, oh, I eat salads all the time. I say, okay, well, make sure you put beans on the salad, not chicken. Don't use a ranch dressing, use vinegar based dressing and, and avoid the croutons. And, uh, and then they kind of look at me and go, oh, how do you know that that's what I put on my salad? Like, well, that's that's the way salads usually are here uh, in the United States, but it is what it is. Yeah. You, do people's eyes kind of, you know, like get a little bit wider when you say that? Like, what, what do you mean a salad's not healthy? Yeah. Well, you know, they do a little bit and, and they it's, it's funny because they're almost like, how do you know what I put on my salad? <laughs> it's like, well, that's what everybody puts on their salad and, and you got to you got to change it to a healthier form. And, you know, when I'm trying to talk to people about changing to a plant-based diet, I always tell them everything you eat now on your current diet, you can make in a healthy form. You just need to make some substitutions just like here for the salad. You know, it's funny. It wasn't until I think I started doing this show that I, I was really heavily scrutinizing uh, nutrition menus from various restaurants and a lot of these places that do offer salads, you look at the fat content in there. You look at the calories in this salad. It is right up there with the hamburger and fries. And in a lot of cases, even more. Yeah, absolutely. I remember I used to work uh, at a grocery store and thank goodness I got promoted to the produce department, not the <laughs> meat department. That was a uh, kind of a uh, faith, I guess. But I remember uh, being a young teenager in high school thinking, oh, I'm going to eat healthy because I was a bit overweight which is a whole different story. And I got the seven layer salad thinking, all right, I'm eating healthy. And I like down this salad and I got to the end of it. And I said, let me look at the nutrition label on the bottom. And I'm like, 110 grams of fat. Holy cow. I cannot believe how much fat was just in this. And of course, cheese and there's some kind of mayo based, you know, dressing that's on there and bacon bits and all these things. And I'm like, huh, I thought that was healthy. Well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Think twice about that. I didn't know that you have a weight loss story. That's pretty, you, you are, sir, you are definitely now getting into the mix for the most interesting guest of <laughs> 2023. I know it's early, but you're a contender at this point. You're definitely going to be. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 
So we've got beans, we've got greens, and now let's shift to something that's a little bit more sweet. What's your number three, Doc? I like the berries. Uh, I honestly do. High antioxidant capacity. Raspberries, very high fiber. Uh, and, you know, you really do. You know, people have, you know, a, a natural innate uh, craving for sugar. And the refined sugars are so bad for you and so addictive uh, that, you, you know, it's so much better to get sugar from a natural state such as as fruit uh, and berries um, are a little bit higher fiber they're a little bit lower on what we call the glycemic index uh, depending on which one you're talking about and uh, and yeah you get so many antioxidants there that I, I do promote blueberries have some data about blood pressure and uh, and they're just super packed in antioxidants and, and higher in fiber so uh, I, I definitely every single day I'm you know having uh, berries and 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 who doesn't like berries? I mean, berries are great, right? I, I you have a lot of kids; they all eat plant based, and it's like berries are all all over the place every single day. And I know that by giving them that, it's kind of filling their their sweet tooth there, uh, and it's it's giving them good nutrition and uh, good brain health, good heart health, all the things you need. You mentioned blueberries. Is that at the top of your mountain in terms of berries and heart health, or are there some other contenders there? I, you know, I wouldn't, I'd say it's hard to compare which berry is, is better. Uh, they're all good. They all are high fiber, no cholesterol, no saturated fat, high in antioxidants. It's nice to get a lot of different colors uh, in your diet and berries certainly help to add the colors to get you different uh, phytonutrients in there. Um, you know, some people say, oh, golden berries and goji berries are more, you know, higher in antioxidants and such. They're harder to get fresh uh, in some markets, but um, I, I don't, I don't favor any berry over another. There's so many to choose from. Might as well mix it up so you don't end up getting, you know, bored of eating the same berry every single day. And let's do frozen versus fresh debate. You get the same uh, benefits from either kind. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've even heard, and I don't know about the science behind this, but I've heard some lifestyle medicine experts, nutrition experts say that sometimes frozen is even better than fresh simply because they are frozen at their peak ripeness. Uh, and then the nutrients are kind of locked away in, in the frozen uh, in the frozen food item. And then you know, thaw it out. It's not like they're going anywhere. You're still getting all that uh, all those nutrients that are in there. Uh, so it, yet it, it doesn't matter whether it's fruit or vegetable. Uh, frozen's fine. Again, just looking at the ingredients in that to make sure they're not adding something, adding salt, adding sugar, adding oils or whatever. You just want that one ingredient, just that healthy, unprocessed plant-based food. Let's get a little bit nerdy here and talk a little bit more about antioxidants. Uh, we hear so much about them, but I'm not sure that a lot of people truly understand exactly how it is that they benefit them. They just know the word antioxidant is healthy. So when it comes specifically to heart health, how are those antioxidants keeping everything beating nice and strong? Well, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people are, I wouldn't maybe confuse or not as aware of the benefits is because of lack of big clinical research trials, randomized controlled trials, looking at specific antioxidants and, and examining outcomes like heart attack, stroke, and death. There's no money to be made in antioxidants, really. So no big company is going to um, fund a huge research trial. You can't patent uh, an antioxidant because it's a natural, natural substance. So there's a lot of biochemical data uh, that kind of says that, hey, you can knock inflammation down and, and you can improve lots of different things, cancer risk and, and heart disease risk, but it's not really researched to the extent that we really wish it would be. And you'll hear these phytonutrients that only come in plants uh, that are very strong uh, antioxidants many times. And uh, really, it's it's they're all good for you, but they're not what we call essential nutrients, right? And that's the criticism. It's like, well, you can live without these things. So how important can they really be? And that's why people get confused when they get mixed messages. But, you know, certainly there are plenty of studies to show cancer reduction, heart disease, uh, inflammation stuff uh, improves. Does that really result in overall improved outcomes? Probably, because look at the clinical trials with all, you know, Dean Ornish and all the heart disease reversal. And we know that eating plant-based, which has tons of phytonutrients and antioxidants, can lower out, uh, outcomes, you know, heart attacks and stroke risk. So it, it's, it's definitely uh, a super important part of the diet. What are the berries that are in Dr. Loam's refrigerator right now? 
Ah, geez. Oh, actually, a lot. You wouldn't believe. Uh, we, we have usually raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and strawberries. We almost always have those four. Um, at where I where I currently live out in California is a huge berry farm, huge berry dis uh, distribution. I have some friends that work for berry companies, uh, which is which is great. So they're they're readily available around here. Uh, I also do have uh, golden berries uh, that are. are dried. It's probably better not to eat them dried, but uh, I put them sometimes in the oatmeal just to give a little tangy extra uh, berry kick to it. So a golden berry, is that kind of like a golden raisin? I think it's also called, um, yeah, no, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a golden raisin, but it's, it's a little bit bigger. Yeah. And it's very, very tart. Uh, in, and I don't know, for some reason I like them. <laughs> yeah. Pucker up, man. Enjoy the oatmeal, yeah. whatever it takes. All right. So we've got beans, we've got greens and we've got berries. And those are the three foods that can really keep your heart pumping in fine fashion. Um, let's go back though, to kind of comparing the diets here before we talk about your incredible story. Um, when it comes to diet versus smoking, we hear so much about heart disease being preventable. Is it possible to say that diet is as bad for you and your heart as smoking? I would actually go as far as to say that diet is more important than smoking risk. Now, of course, smoking is not good for you. Not only is there heart disease risk, there's cancer risk and lung disease risk and, and some other things as well. But if you really had to say somebody who had a horrible diet, standard American diet, uh, high in processed food, saturated fat and cholesterol, and they smoked and you can only choose one thing either change the diet, go on a plant-based diet, or stop smoking, I would no question recommend the dietary change. And uh, one of the reasons why is, uh, yeah, smoking can cause inflammation, damage the arteries, but you know what? So can diet. A diet can cause inflammation and damage the arteries. But here's the thing that diet does uh, that smoking doesn't, it's lower your cholesterol numbers, right? The uh, many experts say that the prerequisite that you must have to clog your arteries up with cholesterol plaque is an elevated LDL cholesterol. And many people throw that threshold of 70 milligrams per deciliter out there. Meaning if you ate a clean plant-based diet and were one of those lucky people that on that diet, which many people do, can get their LDL under that 70 mark, holy cow, almost nothing else matters. The prerequisite to clogging your arteries is having that LDL up. So if your LDL is 60 because of your plant-based diet, theoretically smoking won't really cause much harm to your arteries and your circulation. So, and not only, again, if you're having the cholesterol low through diet, but eating a plant-based diet is going to be anti-inflammatory. It's not going to, your diet's not going to damage your arteries and maybe to some degree with all those antioxidants can help slightly cancel out the effects of, of the pro-inflammatory part of, of smoking cigarettes and all those toxins that come through. So I would, I would no question say diet is more important than something like cigarettes. Let's play a little what if game now. Right now, we know that one in three deaths here in the US come from either heart disease or a stroke. What would that number change to if everybody started to eat a plant-based diet? Well, that's that's a great question. Uh, certainly, if you combine the plant-based diet with not smoking and, and, and being physically active, maintaining a healthy weight, we can, according to the World Health Organization, we can at least 80% of heart disease is preventable. And many other institutions think the number is 90% or even more, if you ask uh, Dr. Dean Ornish, of course. So, I mean, it, it, it boggles me to think that every year in the United States, somewhere around 500,000 Americans die from this disease, which is predominantly preventable. And a statistic I like to tell people, which really kind of hits home is that every year in the United States, just as many people die from heart disease as the number of American soldiers that died in combat in all wars in American history combined ever. That's a huge number every year. And we essentially have a cure for it, right? Plant-based diet, exercise, don't smoke. But we, for some reason, have kind of actively chosen to ignore it as a culture, as a food system, and even as a healthcare system and government policies are not just doing enough to prevent this disease when we know the science has shown that we can do it and we really should be working harder to get this done. And you and I, before we started to roll on this interview, were actually doing some number crunching and just came up with an astounding estimation on just how frequently somebody's life could be saved if they were adhering to this healthier plant-based diet. When you break that number down, you're talking about saving in excess of 80% of people who are dying every single year, 80% of that 500,000. Minute by minute, aren't we talking somewhere in the ballpark of saving a life literally every 60 seconds? 
Yeah, that's that's about right. That's about right. And so many people die from heart disease in the United States, such an astounding number. When you when you break it down, it's about about one a minute. That's a, an insanely huge number to think how many lives could be saved. It's it's just it's it just still blows my mind away. And it's one of the realizations back when um, when I first watched Forks Over Knives, which was in 2016, when I weighed uh, nearly 100 pounds heavier. I had that realization. I saw those numbers and I actually literally became angry. And I said, how is it that we haven't been doing more for this? Why is not diet and lifestyle the main focus of my training and my cardiology training? It wasn't actually, I don't remember getting any nutrition lectures or diet lectures at all. It wasn't even a part of it. It was all medication, surgeries and procedures. And that's when I just started to say, listen, uh, this is something that we really need to push forward and work harder for. And so I've done all I can to, to spread the message, just like you guys do such a great job here on this podcast. So. Well, thank you, my friend. Uh, you're doing an outstanding job here. And then I'll, I'll take it a step forward. I really want to hammer this point home. We've been talking now for a little bit over 20 minutes. That means that since we've been talking, 20 people will have died of heart disease. I mean, that that is just astronomical. And as we continue to talk, that number is going to continue to climb. And as every minute passes throughout the day, you're watching this right now, that number will continue to climb ever higher. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, a lot of these poor diets, at least in my case, and perhaps in yours as well, they've really got established at a young age. And one of the things that a number of guests who have been on the show are concerned about are these increasing numbers of heart disease cases among younger people. Who, like, what is the youngest heart patient that you have worked with whose case was preventable? Geez, I would probably say 28, maybe mm. 40 um, years old. Uh, and these are people who are obese. Uh, they're eating horrible diets. They probably do have a, a genetic predisposition on top of it. And maybe they smoke cigarettes and they, you know, like just like our culture, if you do the things your culture does, you're going to get the diseases that your culture gets. Granted, as our culture, you know, gets worse and worse with diet and becomes more obese, uh, you're going to see people developing heart disease at a younger and, and younger age. And to think of a, a 28 year old needing an open heart bypass surgery for multiple, you know, coronary blockages, it's like, holy cow, that's crazy. That's uh, such a, a young age. And uh, it's it's only it's only getting worse uh, with childhood obesity rates going up so much. It's um, it, it's it's a big problem. And of course, we have the solution. We just need to actually, you know, implement that solution and, and make the change and save so many lives. And before we get to your story, my final question here is this. Uh, you go into the grocery store now, you go down the frozen food aisle, you go down any snack aisle, you see a lot of vegan foods now, prepackaged, not necessarily lower in fat or calories. When it comes to heart health, are there still concerns with those despite the fact that there aren't those animal proteins in there that you were mentioning close to the top of the interview? I would say, yeah, there's a little concern for sure. Now, no question that these processed uh, vegan type foods that may have some oil and sugar and salt and and the fiber removed from it to uh, use a, protein, a soy protein isolate, you know, for the burger or whatever it ends up being, um, it, it's probably a step in the right direction, right? Because it's, it's helping you avoid the actual animal-based food or, or the red meat. So it, it's likely when you compare it healthier than eating the animal-based uh, food that's similar, but I wouldn't, it definitely wouldn't call it healthy, uh, certainly healthier for the animals and healthier for the planet is why one of the reasons these things have been so, so popular, but in regards to heart health, eh, uh, you might see some reduction in, in heart disease risk if you move from eating uh, animal-based foods to some of these uh, substitutes that are vegan, as long as you're also really pounding the veggies and the other healthy stuff and trying to keep it a little bit lower in fat. But really the, the magic comes is when you eat the unprocessed plant-based version. So instead of the processed vegan burger, trying to eat the bean burger is, is way better to go, you know, much better choice for your heart health. Now I wanna share one of the most incredible stories ever to be told here on the show. Uh, you are here today, not just because you're a hero to your patients, but you're a hero to two people in particular um, who had a heart attack during a marathon that you were running. Walk us through that day. Walk us through what happened. Just extraordinary. Oh, yeah. You know, you never know, I guess, what life's going to throw at you. Um, I, it was a, a regular morning. I was running my first half marathon in a while because COVID has shut things down. And I was running with my two older kids, um, their first half marathon, they're cross country runners. 
And, uh, you know, at mile three, uh, I saw a runner collapse and, uh, and I was like, oh no, that's not good. It was right in front of me, maybe 30 feet or so. And I could tell it wasn't a good thing. He didn't just faint. He didn't just trip. He down, he went, uh, hit his head. And as I got closer, uh, assessed him real quick, I could tell he had no pulse, wasn't breathing, wasn't good. So I uh, started CPR right away. Some other people stopped and helped and uh, called 911. And eventually a defibrillator arrived and it showed a fatal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, which the only way to get somebody back from that is a shock, a defibrillation. So delivered a shock, his heartbeat came back, uh, eventually woke up and he was confused, got him in the ambulance. And I was like, geez, you know, I can't believe this just happened to me. I, you know, I'm as a cardiologist, I've ran uh, hundreds of cardiac arrest uh, codes, we call them in the hospital. We always have uh, IV access, nurses, defibrillators, all these things there. And it's just, you know, something that we're trained to do, but it's never happened to me outside the hospital. Uh, and so it was kind of a, a different experience, but I was frazzled a little bit and said, oh, I'm glad we got this guy back and, and things look like it's gonna be good. He's in the paramedics hands on his way to the hospital. Should I keep going? Should I keep running? I'm like, well, my kids are not way in front of me. I guess I might as well keep going. So I kept going to the race. I, you know, I talked to the ER and the uh, cardiologist that was going to take care of the, the runner, the hospital uh, intermittently, but just, you know, eventually finished the race, crossed the finish line. And guess what? Another guy collapsed right in front of me. I couldn't believe it. Uh, down he went, hit his head again. I could tell it wasn't good. No pulse, wasn't breathing. So I said, okay, you know, for a brief moment, I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe this is happening twice, but let's, let's do it again. So I uh, uh, started chest compressions and um, a, a volunteer, a race volunteer quickly brought a defibrillator this time because the medical tent was right at the finish line. And we were able to hook him up to a defibrillator probably within a minute, a minute and a half of him going down. And it said, you know, shock advised, indicating again, a fatal arrhythmia, ventricular fibrillation. And we shocked his heart and I started chest compressions again, like we're supposed to do. And he quickly woke up and he's, what am I doing down here? And he, he got on his watch and he stopped his Strava app to, you know, end his run. He's like, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta get up. I gotta get up. I want to go get my medal. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't get up. You literally, you just died uh, here and, and we got you back. And, uh, you know, you got to stay here. We got to bring you to the hospital. And, and he looked so confused. Um, but uh, both of these runners, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, it's, it's crazy statistically, to have two runners uh, have cardiac arrests in one race, it's crazy for both of them to survive. In general, out of hospital cardiac arrest is only a 5% survival. When it's a part of a big race like this and there's medical staff and more people around, the survival goes up to around 30%, but still 30% survival is not that great. Not only did both of these runners survive, but they made full recoveries. Both had coronary artery disease, cholesterol, calcium plaque buildup in their coronary arteries, received stents. Uh, and made complete full recoveries. So, wow, it was definitely um, not something I expected uh, during that race. Uh, and uh, being in the right place in the right time uh, is, I mean, a lot of people call it a, a miracle. And I'm just super happy that that they did well, they made good recoveries. And a lot of thanks to the, the, the volunteers at the race, the people who brought the defibrillators, the race director, who set up all the safety, the ER docs, all the, everybody else, the hospital contributed to their care. It, it was an amazing team effort. And uh, it's so cool that we got to reunite uh, on the Today Show and the, the two runners got to meet each other for the first time on the Today Show and it's gotten a lot of attention, uh, allowing us to spread uh, a positive message, of course. Might as well use this opportunity to tell people, you know, learning CPR is super important, but even more important, is prevention, prevent that cardiac arrest, eat a plant-based diet, exercise is only maybe 20% of heart health. The diet is by far the most important part. That's absolutely extraordinary. And as you're telling me about watching the second gentleman go down after crossing the finish line, you had just finished the race yourself. I'm wondering yeah. like, where this energy is coming from to be able <laughs> to do the chest compressions. You know, I've run 10 full marathons uh, and, and half marathons still a lot. And yes, I was tired, but you know, you have adrenaline going the whole race. When something like that happens, here comes some more adrenaline. You you, you got to do uh, what you got to do. And somebody's life is on the line. And um, it, and thank goodness, uh, you know, I don't know how long I could have done chest compressions for, but the defibrillator came pretty quick. So. <laughs>
Um, you mentioned some full recoveries for these guys. They're getting a second crack at life here, which is absolutely fantastic. Have they implemented changes to become more heart healthy themselves? Yeah, I, I was, you know, of course, afterwards, uh, I sent them all the plant based resources that I sent all my patients. I have a whole email set up that uh, explains things, uh, you know, how important it is to eat plant based and give resources like, you know, Dean Ornish's and how not to die and preventing reverse heart disease by Caldwell Essence and all these different things, videos to watch, uh, recipe website. So I sent them both those resources. And um, when we reunited on the Today Show, one of the runners has essentially become 100% plant-based and the other one is at about 80 to 90% with a goal of 100. One of the runners got their son, who of course doesn't wanna follow in his father's footsteps to go 100% plant-based as well. And they say they love it and it's uh, it's changed their life. So I do think that you know, when a big life event happens like this, it is an absolute perfect time uh, to, to really implement changes. It's a great teaching moment when people are admitted to the hospital for a heart attack. That's why right there you need to start uh, getting that message across where I was at previously uh, in Chicago, we actually got forks over knives to be shown in the hospital room on the TV and we could turn it on. So I would turn it on for patients all the time and say, watch this. <laughs> and so you got to start the teaching right there when they, you have their attention for sure at that moment. Man, that's, that's so good to hear. Um, I'm curious, going back to what it was we were talking about with prevention. And it's really kind of impossible to say, but just take your best guess. Had they been eating this healthier diet going into it, do you think you still would have had two lives to save that day? No, I mean, probably not. Probably not. We, um, you know, I don't know their specifics, like what their cholesterol numbers were, uh, et cetera, but they certainly were well fit athletes having run multiple half marathons. But, you know, very few people follow the proper diet. It's getting, you know, more and more people are doing it now. But, you know, both of these runners were not following uh, a plant based diet. Uh, and it's very likely that had they been doing the right thing, whole food, plant based, keep it low in fat, especially the sooner you start it in life, the sooner you get the LDL cholesterol down, the sooner you knock out inflammation, the better you're going to be. We know that cholesterol plaque starts to build up in childhood and takes decades and decades to accumulate to the point where something like this can happen. You know, it's very it's very likely that had they uh, grown up in one of those blue zones where they eat predominantly plant based and, and all that, that they would have not had the cardiac arrest. But, you know, I guess you never know. There's a small genetic component to heart disease. But of course, diet and lifestyle is is way more powerful than any genetic predisposition. And how are you feeling about your own heart disease risk these days compared to where you were at? I believe you said in 2016. Yeah, so my LDL cholesterol was around 135. When I went strict Esselstyn for a couple of months, I got it down to 60. And as I introduced a little bit more avocado and nuts and seeds, it came up to 68. But I'm like, hey, 68, I'll take it. That's under that 70 threshold, just barely. So I'm feeling much better about my own heart disease risk. And, um, you know, in the, in the famous words of uh, Dr. Kim Williams, who I'm a big fan of, he says, I don't mind dying. I just don't want it to be my fault. Uh, and so, uh, so, you know, I feel like I'm doing everything that I can personally. And, you know, as a cardiologist with a lot of patients who need to make positive lifestyle changes, how can I advocate people to make the proper changes if I'm not doing it myself? So you got to be a good example. Same thing for parents and kids to get my kids to eat healthy. If, if the parents aren't eating healthy, why would the kids ever do it? Fantastic point. Fantastic point. I would love to have you back on again in the future. I feel like this is a conversation that could continue indefinitely, but I know that <laughs> you have more lives to go save, my friend. No, thanks. It's it's an honor to be on here, and uh, and I appreciate you spreading this this positive message and all the all the great work you guys do here at PCRM and Exam Room Podcast. Oh, it's my honor, and thank you for doing everything that you're doing. Uh, the viewers right now who are listening, who are watching the exam roomies, who would love to be able to follow you, get in touch with you. What's the easiest place to reach you? Uh, probably social media. Twitter is at Steve Loam. Um, you know, I have a Dr. Stephen Loam Facebook page uh, that you can follow. I had a nonprofit organization, Plant Based Nutrition Movement, PBNM.org. You can sign up for the newsletter there and see all the different events and advocacy that we're doing there. And then I have a, a website, heartstrong.com, which is an online do it yourself, you know, four phase, get healthy, get the animal products out, start exercising, and eventually transitions people over to a more Esselstyn Ornish type diet. So lots of different things I'm trying to do to spread this message. 
Yeah, we've made it really easy for you right now. If you scroll down <laughs> to the show description, the links are right there. All you need to do is click on it. We can get you over to follow him on social media and those websites right there as well. Dr. Stephen Loam, thank you so much, my friend. I, this has just been an extraordinary treat, and you really have just shot up the hero ladder. I don't I don't even know how else to say it. Like what you did that day and what you continue to do every single day is nothing short of a miracle. There truly is no other word for it. Thank you so very much. No, thank you for the kind words. All right. And if you've enjoyed today's interview by by all means, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel and like this video and share it with somebody who is in your life who you feel could use a little heart health tip or two can really make a ginormous difference as you've learned here today. But for today, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen. And to you exam roomies, thank you so very much for raising your health IQs with us. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again very soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>